Okay, there we go. It's good to see all your faces again. Really blessed by the song, and thank you, Mr. Neal, for your, your kindness. And thank you, all of you. Uh, just really made me feel at home. I enjoy just being around you. And, you know, I was here to, you know, sometimes you look at things like going to a week of prayer or going to a certain place and sharing with others, but, you know, it's truly like you guys have been sharing with me. You know, I've been so richly blessed. Uh, boy, the, the class, the conversation. So I just want to thank you so much uh, for having me here because I've been the one getting ministered to. And I just want to praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> well, I've been waiting all week to say this, so now I'm going to say it. Happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. I've been looking forward to that. Aren't you guys happy? Amen. Amen. I'm happy too. Well, I'm so excited to get into um, our talk tonight. I will ask that you would please pray for me. And uh, yeah, just, just pray, for your, pray for all of us. Pr just pray that the Lord put his words in my mouth. And uh, let the Lord direct. How about that? All right, I'm going to go ahead and kneel for a word of prayer. Uh, you can bow your heads if you like. And uh, if you like to kneel, you can do that as well. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you so much for Jesus. Lord, I want to thank you so much for your mercies. I want to thank you so much for being personal with us. And I'm asking tonight that you would especially be personal. Even though we are in this group, even though there's many of us here, I want to ask that you would speak to us, speak to me, as though there was no one else here. And Lord, I just want to ask that um, I, I thank you for these gifts, and I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, I'm asking you to go with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And we're going to begin at verse 43. Up until this point, um, of course, we find John the Baptist is preaching. Uh, we find that there are some disciples that, that they find Jesus and they follow Jesus because of the words of John. And we also find that these disciples that find Jesus they actually go and find others. And they kind of represent what we should be. When we find Jesus, we should go out and find others. Well, one of those disciples, his name was Philip. I really like Philip. If you read Philip in the Bible, Philip was all that, always that guy that, you know what? He didn't quite know how to be an evangelist, it seems in my mind, but he always did something. He always did something. And we're going to look at one of those stories, but you know, I, I think about Philip when, he was, when, the, when the Grecians were coming. And they were saying, we would see Jesus. And Philip went and got, I believe he went to get Andrew. And it seemed like he didn't quite know what to do. But they said, look, let's just take him to Jesus. And that's a lesson for us. You know, sometimes we don't know quite what to do. Bring him to Jesus. Bring him to Jesus. But we're going to pick up in a story here. It's in verse 43, John chapter 1, verse 43. And we're getting to a point tonight. And the Bible says, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip findeth Nathanael, said unto him, We have what, everyone? We have found the Messiah. I thought that was very interesting. You know, sometimes we talk about, well, we found Jesus. I found Jesus. Jesus is in my life. But in reality, Jesus was looking for you. Jesus found Philip. Philip says, We have found the Messiah. No, Jesus was looking for him, and he found him. Jesus, Philip responded. And then notice what the Bible says. He says, we have found the Messiah, or found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth is the son of Joseph. Notice that. And Nathanael said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said unto him, he didn't quite know what to say, <laughs> but he said unto him, what, everyone? Come and see. I like that about Philip. Hey, just come and see. Just come and see. Verse 47. And Jesus said unto Nathanael, coming, or, or Jesus saw Nathanael coming unto him, and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And Nathanael said unto him, Whence, thou, whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Ellen White actually says that 
that God had saw for Saul. Philip was under the fig tree. He was pondering uh, about the Messiah. He was, he was always, so, he was a student of the word. He was looking for the Messiah. And Jesus, though he was not there, he saw Philip under the fig tree. Wouldn't that be pretty amazing? That would be a miracle. Like, wait, you saw me? Now notice what the Bible says. Notice Philip's response. And Nathaniel, or Nathaniel's response. And Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art just not the son of Joseph. Thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I see thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I love the story of Philip, or Nathaniel. Philip, too. But I love the story of Nathaniel because there's something that's very interesting about this story to me, and that is two things, actually. The first thing is that Nathaniel has this amazing experience with Jesus. He has this amazing experience with Jesus, and the thing I love about it is that it wasn't Philip's experience, it wasn't Andrew's experience, it wasn't any of the other disciples' experience. He was studying the Word of God, but guess what? He had a personal experience with Jesus. And I love that, and so he has this personal experience. He's like, wow, no one else could have given Nathaniel's testimony. He's like, look, that's my testimony. Jesus saw me under a tree. That was miraculous. That blew, my, blew me off my feet. But the other thing that really gets me about this experience is that Nathaniel, Jesus tells Nathaniel, listen, you think that was something? There's more coming. Nathaniel had an experience where he said, listen, if that was sweet, then wow, could you imagine things, his relationship with Jesus getting any sweeter than that? But Jesus promised that it would. This testimony resonates with me. Because as I was looking through the Bible and I was thinking to myself, you know, when I think about my experience, is there anyone in the Bible that really fits my experience? No, I didn't go up beating a whole lot of people up with the power of God like Samson. And then God had to take me from this, this life of, you know, uh, uh, you know Samson's life, right? End up blind. Ended up in prison. God didn't take me from that. You know, I didn't have this, this, this experience like Mary where Mary was, you know, she's like seven devils. You know, I, I don't envy her for that, but I haven't had that experience. I haven't had experience like some of the other people have had, but yet all I can tell you is that I know what Jesus has done for me. And like the, like the man, the blind, the, the poor blind uh, man, he said, listen, I don't know. All I know is that I once was blind and now I see and that's my story. My friends, I want to tell you tonight, I want to tell you my story. I can't tell you someone else's story. I can't tell you I've been on death row and came back. I can't tell you I was strung out on drugs. I can't tell you all that. All I know is that I was blind, but now I see. And I want to tell you what Jesus did for me. I want to begin in our story by going back just a little bit. You've got to get a little bit of background. I'm not going to try to keep it long tonight. There's so many other little nuances, but I'm going to try to shorten this thing because I want to get to a point. But if I, if I go back, I have to tell you this background. My parents, I grew up for the most part a seven-day Adventist. Someone should have said amen. amen. Listen, I do not regret growing up a seven-day Adventist. I grew up in a seven-day Adventist home. Praise God. God knew if he would have put me somewhere else, I probably wouldn't be where I am. So I, I needed that. <laughs> I grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist home. Uh, my parents, when I was young, were actually uh, converted uh, when I was still quite young, as far as I can remember the story. Uh, before I was born, they were, they were, my mom was not a Christian. She was not a, a Seventh-day Adventist, and she was living for the world. My dad was actually uh, really, he had a really, really bad uh, drug problem. He was actually uh, on crack cocaine and some other very, very strong drugs. And I, and, but when I was young, my parents, was con, were, they were converted. And I can remember, uh, I love hearing my dad's story. I probably shared this with some of you, but my dad had this really amazing uh, testimony how he was on drugs. He was just praying. He was like, Lord, I can't break this thing. He was praying, and he was asking God to clean him up. 
but he was still struggling. And he said one day he was out in the, you know, just out in the, in the world, out in the streets, and he was trying to get something to fix his drug habit, but there was police officers around. And so he's talking to this, this, this drug dealer, and he's like, look, you know, he's trying to be quick, he's trying to be fast, and there's officers around. And he's, he, he takes this stuff, he gives him the money, he runs back home. And he had been praying, remember, that God cleans him up. So he said he gets home, and he unravels this little package that was, he, he was dealt, and he said when he opened it up, he was cheated. The man gave him soap. So he was upset. He was like, you know, he was mad. He wanted to do something about it. And then the Holy Spirit touched his heart. He said, listen, you asked me to clean you up. He never went back. He never went back. I love that story. I wish he could tell his own story tonight, but he's not here. But my parents... Because God had did something really, really amazing in them, they were very zealous for God. They weren't, they, they weren't just like playing games. I, I really appreciate My parents were serious about their walk with God. And so there was a lot of things that I really appreciated about what my parents did. They were, my, my, my dad was really big on evangelism. And even, even, you know, at coming early into the church, he was really big on that. I can remember that we used to pe bring people to our home uh, who, you know, they were they, like uh, full-blown aides, and they would bring them to our house, and we would minister to them for Sabbath. I remember we used to have young kids in our neighborhood, in our, in our little neighborhood kids, and they would come to our house on Friday night, and my mom would fix cheesecake. We weren't, I don't even think we were vegetarians then. She would fix some cheese, cheesecake, and my dad would give them a worship talk. And they would love it. He would tell them about end-time events. He was like, wow, we love this. So they were always trying to reach out to other people. Um, they made really big decisions for Christ. My mom... Uh, at a time where homeschooling was not popular, she said, listen, I want my kids to, to know Jesus. And so she decided to homeschool. And it was amazing how it happened. She was like, Lord, what should I do for my children? It seems like they're, they're, you know, what can I do? And she's walking to the library one day, and suddenly as she was praying this, there's these books about homeschool on the wall. She had never heard of it. She started reading it, and she was like, you know what? I think this is what I need to do. And my dad was there to support her. So as young Christians in the faith, they were really serious about God. They were going to Bible studies. I can remember passing out literature for, or, or handouts for E.E. E. Cleveland. Some of you may not, may not know him. Anyone? Some of you know E.E. E. Cleveland. I remember passing out handouts for E.E. E. Cleveland. I was involved with ministry. I was involved. My parents wanted me to grow. But like new Christians, there are a couple of things that, that they weren't so strong on. They were new Christians. And so I can remember when I was a kid, my dad would have worships. And those worships were long. They were very long. Uh, um, and, and I have mercy because my dad was a new Christian. He was just doing what he knew. But I remember he had these three big volumes of Ellen White, and he had a whole list of books inside. And he would open one of those books. It was these big, huge books, and he would start reading. And in my mind, as a child, I was, I was thinking, is he going to read every book in that thing? Like, it just seemed like it was so long. And because of that, it just, you know, my devotion, I was like worship, I was like, ah, oh, I'm not really sure about this, this whole worship thing. Uh, they also had some, some worldly remnants. I remember my mom, uh, you know, it was just how she was raised. She said, listen, if you go to school, if anyone messes with you the wrong way or touch you in the wrong way, she was like, you deal with it. It's like, you deal with it. And I learned to deal with things all the way up to my junior year in high school. I would fight a lot. I remember my mom had to pick me up. I was like, why are you, you know, getting in trouble again, putting your hands on people? Like, what's going on? And I was like, well, someone tried to mess with me in the wrong way. And I would always fight people. Had a, had a pretty, pretty tough temper. But I share with you that background because that helped to shape my life a little. A little. Because my parents, because they had a strong desire for God, there were really many times in my life that I really wanted to serve God. I really did. I can remember as a kid having this little Bible storybook, and it was mainly just pictures. But for some odd reason, I was looking through that Bible storybook, and I got to the story of Jesus, and I was just a little boy. I was probably five years old. And I read it, or was looking at the pictures, and it seemed like my siblings were with me, but it touched my heart so much, just the pictures. And I'm running downstairs, and my mom's like, oh, I love Jesus, and tears are just falling all down, uh, running down my face. I really, there was moments in my life I really loved Jesus, or wanted to love Jesus, and I believe it was because of my parents. Uh, but there was also things, because they were new in the faith, that I was introduced to that was not so Christian. There were things that was world. I remember, you know, dancing off some of the, the music. Uh, I remember, you know, some of the things that we had in our home, uh, some of the movies that we would watch. You know, they were still growing in their faith. But some of those habits I learned when I was young, they actually 
I had to deal with those things later in life. And so that was really something that shaped my life. Well, as I began to get older, um, probably my parents finally moved. Uh, they, we, I was born in Nashville area, and they finally moved outside of Nashville, and they're, they are homeschooled. But I remember when I was probably in fifth grade, my parents decided to move back to Memphis. It was about like fifth or sixth, fifth or sixth grade. And I moved back to Memphis, and it was like culture shock. You know, I had already heard I used to go visit and everything, but it was kind of like, wow, you know, this is kind of culture shock because the first school I went into uh, was a gang-related school. Uh, they, they wore red, and other schools wore blue. And I remember my favorite color was blue, so guess what I would wear? Yeah. I remember they asked me. They was like, listen, do you want to, to join this gang? And I was like, my dad was always saying, you know, no. Nah. You know, he always gave me what to say, so I'd just go through the drill as to what to say. But I was in that school for two days because within two days, they were already planning to beat me up. And I was like, I could probably fight one, but I don't want to fight all of them. And my mom pulled me out of there. Praise the Lord. But then the next school she took me to was also had gangs in it, but fortunately they wore blue. So I think I was okay with that. But it was there while I was in, in that age, in, in eighth grade or, or ninth grade, these early years where I started to, to really my love for the world begin to grow. My love for wanting to hear all the music that the other students were listening to. I started getting into rap music. I started writing rap songs. I started writing music songs. We started doing freestyle, all this stuff. I was just insaturated with this music. And by the way, I was playing, I was still playing basketball. I always loved basketball, played basketball a lot. But it was just, I started to love what, what was around me. I started to conform to what was around me. And I can remember my love for spiritual things begin to die. So I, re I remember, for example, going to church. And I would go to church, and I would sleep. I would sit in the back, and I would just do this. And I would sleep in church. Sermons were not interesting to me. Not interesting at all. But even in the midst of all that, God was still moving. There was a story one day. I was at home, and my dad, by the way, my dad, my dad used to always pray for me. It was like early in the morning. It had to be like 4.30. And I would see him praying. I would see him up. His light would be on. He's praying or whatnot. He would always tell me, I'm praying for you. And that would annoy me. I was like, I don't want you to tell me you're praying for me. Like, that was annoying to me. But nevertheless, he was telling me that. And let me tell you something, parents. Even if, if we as young people sometimes think that that's annoying, that actually served to be a blessing to me later. That touched my heart later. Don't give up. Don't give up. But my dad, he was always saying he was praying for me, and he would always place sermons in the house. And so I remember this one specific day, he was playing this sermon in the kitchen, and I don't know, it seemed like I was getting ready to do something, but I walk into the kitchen, and I'm not interested in sermons, not interested in spiritual things necessarily. I'm, I'm losing that desire, but I walk into the kitchen, and my dad's playing this sermon, and I'm like, and it was a, it was a sermon by an evangelist by the name of Stephen D. Lewis. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of him, but it was a sermon by the name of Stephen D. Lewis, and it was a sermon called, There's a Judas in the House. Now, I remember walking in there, and I was listening to this sermon. I was thinking to myself, you know, I was just going to listen for a minute. I was going to go grab something and leave, and I'm listening. I'm like, wow, like, this is someone preaching? Like, this is interesting. And I actually sat down. I told my dad, I was like, who is this? He told me, and he was like, you know, I think he was kind of paying attention. I'm sitting there listening. And at the end of it, I was like, that's a really good sermon. And I was like, wow, man, oh well. I went back to my life. But that stayed with me. That stayed with me. So time went on. I started really, really conforming to what was going on when I got to high school. I started, I was never in a gang, but I had a lot of my friends in the gang, cousins that were in the gang in the area. And, you know, I started thinking like that. I started realizing, like, if I'm going to get ahead in school, then I have, I have to have friends you know, people have their own space when you go to the cafeteria, their own little space, like don't sit in our table. People had their own space on the bleachers, don't go to those bleachers, those are ours. People had their own spaces on the lockers, like this is our section. So I'm thinking like, look, if I'm going to have to move my way through here, I'm going to have to get friends, and we're going to have, we weren't game, but we're going to have friends, and we're going to get our own space in the locker. And we did, eventually. And we started really getting to know people like, oh, man, we, we started really getting to the point where we were known in school. And it was at that moment my mom decided to ruin it. She decided to say, you know what? I'm sending you to academy. And I was like, what? I said, this is my sophomore year. I worked hard all freshman year to get where I am. 
And I try to beg her, like, don't do this. Like, what? And she's like, nope, you have two choices. You're going to go to Academy, and you have two choices, Madison or Highland. And I was like, can we have a third choice? <laughs> she wasn't having it. And so, and by the way, my parents were planning, because they were seeing the, the results of what was happening in our family. They were really planning on moving back to Nashville, out, of, out away from Memphis, but they hadn't, things hadn't worked out yet. So they, they moved, uh, she's, I finally decided to go to Highland because I had friends in Memphis and some of the churches in Memphis. Um, one of my best friends, in fact, he said, man, I'm going to Highland this year. So I was thinking, I was like, oh, that may not be so bad. So if they're going, I had two of my friends going, I was like, look, I got to go to Highland. So I decided to go to Highland. <clears throat> and um, it was there, when I first got there, it was, this was something I thought was really interesting. I talked to one of the seniors, guys, my first day. And I asked him, because I come from a school that you got to go through metal detectors to get into class. You had, a, you had security guards there. They had to, you know, pat you down. And, you know, I saw guys who just get cut, just, just terrible fights, you know, things you couldn't jump in. But you're like, hey, man, you know, if you do that, you might kill the guy. But you're just trying to, I saw a lot of things like that. And so I thought, like, man, I had students from my public school that say, like, once the first fight started, they're like, oh, yeah, now school started. That's how, that was the mindset. And I was developing that. And I can remember when I got to Highland Academy, the first question I asked to a senior, I said, hey, so how many fights do you guys have here? <laughs> and he was like, he was like, we don't do that. And I was like, what? I was like, man, this school is going to be lame. It's going to be boring. Like, man, come on. And, but in the back of my mind, I was thinking, wow, I actually get to go to school and learn. I'm going to actually like this. But outwardly, I wanted to make it look like, oh, man, you know, you know. But I, I really enjoyed it. Going to school, I started to really enjoy it. I had a little tough time trying to adjust, but I really did enjoy it. But I got, uh, once I was there, I got with my friends, and I was still struggling with my spiritual life. I was struggling, like, do I want to follow God? Do I not want to follow God? And I can remember it was my sophomore year that I decided to make a deal in my mind. And the deal in my mind was, you know what? I want to follow God. I'm not going to be too bad, but I really like the world. And so how about for the next two years, I'm going to live for myself. I'm going to live for the world. And then my senior year, I'm going to get my life together. And so that's what I did. I was like, hey, I remember my, like, my junior year. It was like my first time someone took me to like a nightclub or something. And I was like, man, I just, I'm going to live for the world. I never did want to smoke. And that, and that was because the Lord used my brother with that. You know, I, I, try, I almost was going to try it. And my brother was living who knows what kind of life he was living. This was back when I was in eighth grade. And I remember um, wanting to be like my brother, wanting to look up to my brother. And I, I don't know, he was doing a lot of other stuff. I don't want to get into what he was doing. But I remember my eighth grade year, I was at school, and someone was like, hey, you know what? We were, everyone was smoking cigarettes, and they wanted to give me one. And I was like, okay. And I took it, and I was going to go home. I was like, oh, man, my brother's going to be really happy. You know, I'm looking up to my brother. I'm going to get him to do this with me. And I get home, and my brother, who used to always sometimes influence me to do the wrong things, He's half asleep. I know this was the Holy Spirit. I asked him, he's like, I still don't remember that. But he was half asleep, and I was like, hey, you want to go and do this with me? And he's like, he's like, man, that's not even worth it. And he's like, you need to leave it alone. You got, your life is better than that. And I was like, really? Like, I never heard that from him, my eighth grade year. And so I go out, and I was like, man, my brother says it's not worth it. It's not worth it, so I tore it up. <laughs> and to this day, my brother's like, I don't even remember that. But I'm like, praise God, that must have been the Holy Spirit speaking. So I never did, I never did smoke. And some of the other stuff, I, I did do. Um, but I was trying to be very, like, you know, just socially, just went around my friends. So my, my junior year, um, my sophomore year and junior year, I was like, I'm just going to live for the world. Senior year comes around. I'm thinking, all right, this is the year to get it together. I'm going to be a Christian. <laughs> I'm going to love the Lord. A lot of my, ki from my friends got kicked out of school by that time. And uh, some of them had left. And I had two friends I used to hang with. Both of them wanted to be future pastors. And I was like, this is great. Even the friends that God left me with are going to help me give my life to God. Like, this is awesome. But here's the thing I thought was really, really interesting. Once I started trying to live for God, guess what I discovered? I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Like, I started trying to read Steps to Christ, and I was like, I, I don't understand this. Like, and I read it again, like, I don't get it. I remember uh, just trying to, like, trying to stay away from the wrong, trying to do the right, and it seemed like the more I tried, the more my life began to plummet into more evil. I did worse stuff my senior year than I was doing my junior year. 
it brought a quote to my mind in the book Steps to Christ. I want to share this with you. Ellen White says this. I really thought this was happening to me later. She says, beware of procrastination. Do not put off the work of forsaking your sins and seeking purity of heart through Jesus. Here is where, where thousands upon thousands have erred in their eternal loss. I will not here dwell upon the shortness of uncertainty of life. I'm going to skip down. She says this. She says, um, in delay to yield the, the pleading voice of God's Holy Spirit, she says, in choosing to live in sin, for such the delay really is, those who choose to live in sin. She says, sin, however small it may be esteemed, can be indulged in only at the peril of eternal loss or infinite loss. What we do not overcome will overcome us and work out our destruction. When I thought about that, I was like, wow, here I am. I'm trying to live holy now. I could not do it. I had not had a real encounter with Jesus, and it was like all my efforts were in vain. I graduate. By the way, you know, um, there were some other things that happened that year. My, one of my closest uncles passed away, and that kind of got my attention. Uh, I was so busy in, in life and doing all sorts of things, and he was always calling me to check and see, like, how are you doing? Like, you know, do you need anything? And that, that it was like the last month or so of his life, I used to always say, like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to call him back. I'm going to call him back. I'm going to call him back. And back then we had those little caller IDs. And, um, and one day I was like, oh, man, I'm free. I'm going to call him back. So I called him back. Didn't get an answer, left, decided to leave a voicemail. And then my mom calls me back in tears and say, you know, I'm at, I'm at your uncle's house. They found him dead in the house. And your voicemail is like the last one that was on there. I missed him. I missed him. That really affected me. I was like, I really got to give my heart to Christ. And I tried, but I couldn't. How many of you have ever tried to give your heart to Christ but couldn't? Yeah, we've been there. You know why? Because we think we can do it in our own righteousness. And God has to get us to the point to recognize, no, you need me. You need me. So I was trying. Graduated from high school, like I got to get this thing together. My life, this, that summer, whew, boy, my life plummeted. In, in the last, and I can remember hanging out with some friends and some cousins and um, almost getting in some really big trouble. It's like every time I would hang out with them, it's like I would get into some sort of police trouble. It would get worse and get worse and get worse. And one night, we almost got into some really big trouble. We, we picked up a, a friend of theirs that um, he used to sell drugs in the area. And we picked him up, and I was thinking, I was in my sister's car. I was like, should we really pick this guy up? And I was like, ah, whatever. It was just a little night. One of my cousins had to be back home because he had curfew. And I was thinking, like, it's not going to be a big deal. Well, we end up, we we're just going to go eat, just hang out because I was in town. We end up there. We, we eat for a little bit. And um, then we decide, well, let's get home. Uh, because we were running a little late. My, co my cousin had to be home for curfew, and his mom was serious. He had, been, um, he had been in some trouble. So I'm like, let's get you home. So we're flying. We're trying to get home. I'm flying. I'm actually in my sister's car, flying, trying to get home. And lo and behold, I actually passed a police officer. And um, he starts to turn around, and I'm thinking, nah, man, I got to pull over. I just turned 18. I was like, ah, oh, I got to pull over. And they're all like, you can't pull over? They're like, do you know what's happening? And I, was, I, started, and I thought about it. I was like, I got him in the car. I just turned 18. Some of us were minors. So I just took off. And long story short, I end up in this little alley or whatever, turn off all my lights. And I was thinking, I was like, Lord. And they were like, yeah, yeah, that was driving. That was driving. And I was all so mad. And I was like, Lord. I said, if you allow me to get out of this, I'm never hanging out with these guys again. <laughs> and... Um, and I never hung out with them again. I didn't. I, at least I kept that much. Um, but I ended up going to college. I, I actually chose a college, like, you said, like I told you earlier. I had some friends in, in the specific college. And I was like, well, it was, it was Adventist College. And I said, I want to go there. But also, I was still in this, in this effort to make myself righteous. So I was like, OK, I'm going to go to this college. So I ended up going to this college. And within like weeks of being there, like first week, I was like, oh, man, I'm a, yeah, I'm going to try to do right. Then weeks, it's just like my life just plummeted. And it got worse at the college. Now, I wasn't hanging out doing a whole lot of crazy things, but I did a few things. And it just seemed like my life was getting worse. Now it was like the Sabbath was nothing anymore, even though I was at an Adventist college. The Sabbath was nothing anymore. And, um, you know, they just wanted to make sure we were out of the room. I would just try to get checked off on my 
vespers or worships, and it was like, you know, Sabbath was nothing. We did everything on Sabbath, you know, so those of us who hung out. And I started really getting to rap music. I started really writing more music, R&B music. I started really writing these things. And, um, but it was just like, I felt the emptiness, but it was like, there was nothing I could do about this. Like, I'm just plunging. And I was just getting to the part, I was like, you know what, just, just go, just let it go. Just, just plunge into this. And I can remember one, t- one night, as it was a Friday night, and it was a lot of us, a lot of different guys used to, used to rap and do different things. And I had um, gotten with a, a few guys, they were friends of mine, and they were doing a song, I was doing it with them, it was a rap song, so we were all just, for whatever reason, we all met, met in a room, and all these different guys and groups of guys, and they were just in this room rapping on a Friday night. And I get in the room, and, we're, and they're rapping. Actually, I was, I was singing on for their, one of their songs they were doing, and it didn't dawn on me, because I had gone over this song, and I said, it didn't even dawn on me, but as they were singing the song, somewhere in the song, it talks about Satan I visit. And the guy could never rap the song, like we were all be rapping. He's like, when his turn to rap, he's like, look, man, I can't rap unless you guys turn out the lights. And I was like, this is getting really weird. And I was thinking, I was like, okay, well, he'll turn out the lights, and then he'll start rapping like really, 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 really fast. But he couldn't do it with the lights on. And I was like, what is going on? And then I was, when I started singing it, you know, singing in the dark, I'm like, man, why didn't Satan I visit? And it started ringing, dawning in my mind, like, what am I doing? Where has my life gone? My senses are just like, what's going on here? So at that point, I went back to my room after it was all over, and I was like, God, where am I going? I started just pleading to God, like, what has happened? I can't do this. My life, I'm here at this school. I've tried everything. I can't do it. So glad God hears those prayers. I remember like a week or so afterwards, a few weeks afterwards, I decided I was going to go to Vespers. I was like, look, I don't know. Like, I just feel like it was hopeless. So I decided I'm going to go to Vespers. <clears throat> I ended up going to uh, Vespers that night, and it was okay. You know, I ended up going back to the dorm. Go back to the dorm. There's these gentlemen, they're, they're preaching, <clears throat> or they're in the, in the dean's office, and they're listening to a sermon. Now, something I, I forgot to tell you is that, um, you remember I told you about that evangelist that I listened to the first time? Later, my senior year, my dad had a whole video series by him. And I wouldn't listen to anyone else, but I would watch that series. I would watch that. And I was like, man, but it never, I never allowed it to change my heart. I was just like, wow, that's really interesting. Well, when I walk into the dorm the night, um, when well, I'm in college now, I hear, this, all these, I hear this sermon being preached from the dean's apartment, and there's all these guys that are in there. It's like 15, 20 guys. It's not like they're packed in there. And I go, I'm like, man, what's going on? And as I'm listening, I'm thinking, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Well, I, t- I go into the room, and it turns out it's this evangelist. Someone had brought, uh, uh, they had VCR, uh, VHSs back then. Someone had brought the VHS from those same sermons I used to listen to when I was at my, my parents' house. And I was like, man, so I stayed in, I, I sat in, I started listening to that. And, um, and then when we were done, by the way, the guy that brought it went to my grandmother's church. He was a brand new Adventist. He was he and another guy. And they were witnessing to all of us who had grown up Adventists. Can you imagine that? So he's playing this, and at the end of it, he says, Hey, guys, you know, hope you enjoyed the sermon. If anyone wants to come and meet us down in the chaplain just to continue our Sabbath and talk and pray, we're going to be down there in the chaplain. Those two guys, um, two guys announcing this. All the rest of the guys, we're all like, man, that was, that was good. And everyone went to their rooms. And I was like, wow, that was really good. I think I'm going to go back to my room, and I'm going to try to keep Sabbath. That was really inspiring. So I go back to my room, and this night was the first night I really started keeping Sabbath, or trying to. I picked up, I had the Desire of Ages book. I picked it up, and I was like, man, I'm just going to read something. So I started reading, and um, my friend and I, we would never really hang out in the room on Friday night, my roommate. He was my best friend. Um, but tonight, he decided to come into the room. Comes into the room, and he plunges, plunges down his bed, and he decides, I'm going to watch a movie. We always did that on Friday or, you know, fr- or any time, but generally it's during the week. Friday nights, we're hanging out somewhere else. He comes and decides he wants to watch a movie. So I'm like, man, I don't want to be, like, hypocritical or anything, but make it like I'm all holy. I was like, but I am trying to be. So I look over and I'm like, hey, do you mind, like, turn the, the, the computer your direction and, you know, maybe put the headphones on? I was trying to be as nice as I could. Lord knows I still had a temper. But he, he decides, he's, he's like, okay. So he does it, puts it in, and then he decided, 
I guess like five minutes later, he couldn't take it. So he takes the headphones, slams them down, slams down the, the, compu- or the, the, the keyboard, and he's like, man, what is this? And he walks out. And I'm like, and he slams the door. He's mad because I asked him to, to wear that. And I was thinking like, I was mad. I like wanted to fight. It's like, here I am trying to be a Christian. And I was like, what? And I was mad. I was like, God, why did you let this happen? Like, and I was thinking to myself, you know what? This is Satan. He knows I'm trying. I, I got to get out of this room. Though. And then I thought about it. Those, those guys may be downstairs. So I walk downstairs, go into the chapel, and I get down there. And I look, I open the door, and I look, and, and the only people down there is those two guys. And they were just reading. And they looked up, and they was like, oh, wow, someone actually showed up. And they started sharing with me what they were learning about Jesus. And my last week in, in that school, I started going to, they started telling me, I was like, hey, you know they had this Bible study over here, and these people are doing this. I was like, what? I didn't know all this was happening. So I started going to all these different things. I even saw, like, I used to play a lot of basketball. You know, I used to, you know, skip school to go play basketball and do all sorts of stuff. Some of the guys I played basketball with were there, but they never invited me. I was like, wow, you guys knew this all? One of the guys actually led the Bible study. (laughs) But he never once talked to me about Jesus. My friends, we should not be afraid to share Jesus with anyone. We don't know who's in the Valley of Decision. If he would have probably came and talked to me, I probably would have been like, man, I've been seeking for that. But he never did. Anyway, I don't hold it against him. Anyway, my life started to change. But eventually, I was like, look, I can't do this anymore. I'm going home. I don't want to waste money, and I'm not doing anything. I'm going home. So I went home. And while I was home, this progress continued to, to, to go. I started continuing growing. And my elders at my church, praise God for my elders, and my dad was one of the elders, they were having Bible studies and outreach, and they just embraced me. They were like, listen, you're home, and I was having this desire. And they're like, why don't you come to our Bible studies? Why don't you go to outreach with us? So I started doing these various things. And let me tell you something. I started loving the Bible. They started me off with Bible prophecy because I had questions about, wait a minute. I really had questions like, okay, so God may be real, but what if I was a uh, Muslim? What if I was a uh, Buddhist? What if I was? And so they said, listen, you should come in and do the Bible prophecies with us. And they would teach me Bible prophecy. And I was like, wow, God said that. That answers it for me. The Christian God is God. And I start really becoming convinced, but in my mind, I, I never had a real feeling for God. It was just like, you could tell me about the cross, and I'm like, that's nice. But you tell me about prophecy, I'm like, wow, man, that's amazing. It's like, hmm, cross is nice. Like, I don't really get it, but okay. Uh, that's kind of how it was with me. But they kept pursuing me. I kept going. It got to the point where I was sitting in the front of church, and I, I, like, I was never that guy sitting in the back anymore. I was up with my, my Bible. I was like, wow, this is interesting. And uh, they kept working with me. And eventually, I was like, I want to get baptized. But there was one thing that was happening in my heart. In my mind, I was thinking, you know what? I know Jesus' love, but all those promises in the Bible, that's for everybody else. That's not for me. If God so loved the world, that's for everybody else. I've done some bad stuff. And the reason, and and, and the thing is, I didn't just do bad stuff. I knew better. You know, Satan, he has so many ways to get us. If you've been out in the world, he'll tell you, yeah, you're too bad. If you've been in the, in, in the church or grew up in the church, he'll probably tell you, you know what? You may not have done bad things as that person's done, but you knew better. So it's really bad because you knew better. And that's the way I was thinking, like, man, you know, I know better. There's no way God would ever forgive me. But God was moving my heart. Little by little, things were changing in my life. The music started to drop off. You know, the, I started to change my dress. I, start, I stopped dressing like the way I used to. There were so many little things, but in my heart, I still wasn't thinking like nothing was happening. I didn't feel it. Some of us wait for, wait for feeling. You know, Steps of Christ actually tells us. She says, look, you know, if God's voice is speaking to our hearts, if, there's, if we have a desire for something better, recognize this as the voice of God speaking to you. Don't wait for the feeling to give your heart to Jesus. Recognize that as the voice. So coming to an end here. God was changing my heart. I knew he was had the truth, but there was one thing. In my mind, I was thinking, you know what? God has never spoken personally to me. All this truth stuff, it's great. I know it's true. I can tell other people it's now true, but all this is for everyone else. It's not for me. 
but I kept coming. One day, my church decided to have a camp out. <clears throat> and on this camp out, it was like, look, I had never been gone to a camp out, but it's like, look, you should come to this camp out. So I was like, okay, I want to be around Christian people, so I decided to go. Went to the camp out, and I complained about everything. Like the first day, I just complained the whole Friday night. I was like, man, this is, and I was thinking in my mind, this is embarrassing. The church is going to see how, how just, I complain about everything. And I was just complaining, and I don't like this, and I don't like that, and you know, the food is bad, but I wanted to be there. Second day was the Sabbath, and I was just complaining. I was like, man, you know, it's hot. I'm like, why are we going on this walk? Like, couldn't even, and I was just like, man, but in my mind, I was struggling. I was like, oh, man, I, didn't, I came here to be spiritual, like, and, but I was just complaining. I remember before I, I left, by the way, my dad said, oh, last time I was at this place, I saw an eagle. Now, I've been telling you throughout this week that I really like birds, especially raptors, especially eagles. And up until this point, I had never seen an eagle in the wild. Never seen one. But my dad was like, hey, you might be able to see one. I was like, wow, great. But I didn't see one. In fact, the only thing I saw was me complaining. <laughs> didn't see one the first day. Didn't see one the second day. I got so tired of my own complaining that the third day, it was Sunday, we were going to leave. Like after breakfast, we were going to leave. So I decided that Sunday, I said, you know what? I at least want to have one good day with God. One good day. I'm going to get up, Lord, as soon as you ask me to get up, I'm going to get up and have my devotions. But you have to tell someone when you get ready to go out of camp. So I got up, and I was like, I'm going to go have my devotions, went over to where my, um, my dad's tent, and was like, hey, I'm going to go out to this, you know, go out somewhere and have devotions. He's like, hey, wait, wait, I'll come with you. So I decided, or it was like, okay, so he, we went, and we ha I had a beautiful devotion. God was speaking to me, my dad had a beautiful devotion. And afterwards, we was like, hey, let's just share what we were learning. So we shared, and I was like, wow. I was like, wow, this is rich. This, I don't remember having a devotion like this in a long time. And then afterwards, my dad was like, hey, look, I know we have to go back. They're going to probably have breakfast and start picking up soon, uh, breaking down camp. But before we go, you want to go over and watch over the ridge and watch the, the sun break um, over the mountains? I was like, yeah, that'd be great. So we walk out uh, over the ridge, and when we get to the, the ridge area, we just kind of out there looking and and my dad tells me, he said, you know what, it would have been really nice if you could have had a chance to see an eagle while I was out here. I was like, yeah. I said, but you know, hey, maybe next time. We're just kind of talking. And he was like, you know what, I got this idea. How about we pray about it? Now, I never seen God do anything personal for me. I was like, my faith was kind of weak. And I was thinking to myself, pray about it? Like, you're really trying to weaken my faith right now. But he said, yeah, let's pray about it. But in my mind, I didn't, you know, I didn't argue with him. That was my dad. So I was like, okay. So he starts praying, and he's praying. He's, you know, Lord, you know, just really into this prayer. And finally, in the middle of his prayer, he says, Lord, at this very moment, now I only have like three hours left probably at this place. And I'm thinking like, this is a one in a hundred chance. But my dad, he's in the middle of his prayer. He's like, Lord, and he's just, I don't know what got into him, but he was like, Lord, at this very moment, Help us to see an eagle. It would be such a blessing. And I'm thinking, like, in my mind, like, what are you talking about? Like, you're really trying to kill my faith right here. Like, I've been trying to grow in this Christian thing, and you're talking about right now, that's like a one in a thousand chance. I don't know what the, the percentage of that is. But I was like, that's one in a thousand chance this is going to happen. My faith is going to plummet. My dad said amen. And as soon as he said amen, you know what's coming over the horizon? Eagle starts flying right towards us just gliding and my dad is just like you see that you see that and I'm so shocked I can't speak I'm like oh like I don't know what to say and he's like oh he says God is good God is good I'm like what I've never seen anything I've never seen God answer prayer like that and my dad said you know we got to thank God my dad gets excited he gets like really ghetto he's like you know we got to thank God yeah and I'm like okay so we kneel down we thank God and as soon as we thank God, we're looking at this eagle go this way. Guess what we see coming back over the horizon? A second eagle. And it's just gliding towards us. And my dad says, you know what that is? And I'm like, what? He's like, that's God saying thank you. I was like, wow. And once I got over all that, I realized, wait a minute. God did that for me. My dad had seen an eagle already. That prayer was for me. I've never had, had God do something personally for me. And I said, Lord, if that's what you can do, I'm going to give you my whole heart. 
I've given you everything. I came off that mountain. It wasn't long after that I got baptized. Gave my heart to Jesus completely. And let me tell you something. When I thought about that story, I think about Nathaniel. He had something. God did something personally for him. For him. But you know what else God said to him? He said, greater things than these. My friends, tonight I can testify that that wasn't the last good thing God has ever done for me. It has become sweeter and sweeter and better and better. And what I want to tell you tonight is that what God did for me, the little things he seems like he did for me, he can do the same for you. God tonight, he looks at you as though there is no one else in the world. He's like, listen, I'm looking at you and you only. He's a personal God. And God says, look, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting to do something for you and you only. You can say, oh, that's no one else's testimony but mine. Ellen White says something. <laughs> Favorite quote. I know we're, we're wrapping up here. But notice what she says. In this quote found in Desire of Ages, I love it. She says, the soul that has given himself to Christ is more precious in, in, in his sight than the whole world. The Savior would have passed through the agony of Calvary that one, how many? Just one. She says that one might be saved in his kingdom. He will never abandon one for whom he has died unless his followers choose to leave him. He will hold them fast. That's a promise. God says, listen, if it was just you, I'm going to come out of Calvary. I'm going to do something personally for you. And my friends, it's so easy for us to look at everyone else and say, oh, God is doing it for everyone else. God is doing it for that person, that person. God says, no, 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 no. I want to do that for you. I want to be personal for you. But here's the thing. You have to be willing to give you to him. That's the thing. That's the thing. My friends, tonight I I pray, my prayer is that you have given you to Jesus. Some of us, we struggle with that. Some of us, we're kind of like me. You know, we're kind of like, oh man, I want to give myself to God, but I'm not really sure. God says, listen, what is there in the world that could be better than experience with me? Give me you. Don't look at everyone else. Give me you. Give you to Jesus. There's some of us tonight who needs to rededicate you to Jesus. You need to rededicate him. That's all of us, hopefully. <laughs> so tonight, if Jesus has been speaking to your heart. I have a pill tonight. In fact, I have more than one appeal tonight. My first appeal is to those of us who you have felt as though, like, you know what? I've given my heart to Jesus. But Lord, I want to keep my, my life in the hands of Jesus because Jesus says, I will never let you go. I will hold you fast. But you got to choose. And guess what? It's not just choosing once. It's choosing every day. Choosing to keep your life in Jesus. So you want to say tonight, Lord, tonight, I just want to rededicate my heart to you. I want to choose again to keep my life in your hands. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to stand with me tonight. And I'm standing with you because I want to choose to keep my, hand, my life in, your, in, in Christ's hands. There's another group here tonight, and maybe tonight you're thinking in your heart, well, Lord, I want to give my life to you, but there's something in my heart, I just don't feel it. By the way, faith is not a feeling, but it's like, I, I just don't feel it, and, and it seems like I want to draw to Christ, but I just don't know, there's something, but you know what, preacher tonight, if you can just pray for me, just pray for me, because I want it. I just need prayer tonight. If that's you, I'm just asking you to raise your hand. Amen. Amen. There's another group here tonight, and you have made a decision. You said, you know what? Maybe it was this week. Maybe it was this year. But you've made a decision. You said, you know what? I want to follow Jesus. I have consecrated myself to follow Jesus. But, you know, I want to make that known. I want to make that public before men and before angels that I am giving my life to Jesus. And I want to do that in baptism. Maybe I want to do that in far probably preparing for baptism. But I want to make a public confession for Jesus that, Lord, I am yours and I am in your hands. If that's your desire tonight, I'm going to ask you to just step out of your seat and come forward. If that's your desire tonight, step out of your seat and come forward. Amen. Amen. Is there another? If that's your desire tonight, God is waiting. He's waiting on you. He's patient. He's patient.
But there's no better time like now. There's no better time like now. Is there, is there another? God has been working in your heart. You've made a decision that you want to follow Jesus, and you want to make that public. Just step forward. God is standing with you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for, for these ones. The decision you made, you know, the Bible says there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner. It's personal. It's personal. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your mercy. I thank you so much that you see us individually. You see us personally. You see the struggles we're going through. You see the background we have. And Lord, there is nothing too hard for you. And in your great abundance of love, you still reach out to us. Father, I want to ask that you would keep us in your hands. You would keep us safe in your hands. I want to ask, Father, that those who have made decisions for you, that, Lord, you would fill them with the joy of the Lord. They'll recognize that our experience with Jesus can only get sweeter. Yes, there's difficult times, but you walk with us through them. And for those who may be struggling in their hearts and say, Lord, I just need prayer tonight, I want to ask by the grace of your Holy Spirit that you would strengthen them, that you would give them peace, that you would wrestle with their hearts and know that if they take a stand, when they take a stand, they can do it in your strength. Thank you for hearing us tonight. And we ask these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so pleased you could join us for this special event here at Washington Hills College and Academy. If you've enjoyed the programs just as much as I did, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you want to help support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description box below. Thank you so much for joining us. May God richly bless you.